album release. We, you know, independent musicians, it's always tough out there, so she's got to go out and do fundraising. Not the most fun part of her job, I'm sure. We are live streaming tonight. I know. <laughs> We are live streaming, so hello to everyone on the East Coast, and hello to Avery's dad on the East Coast. Right. Um, so if you would like to turn your cell phones off, that would be great. Um, is there anyone that's here for the first time? Awesome. Okay, we also ask that you not use this restroom during the live stream and show. You can if you want to, but we have two other restrooms, one in the back of the store and one up the stairs, so that's always a little bit better during the show. But it's your choice. <laughs> yeah, well, it's quiet. <laughs> anyway, let's let Avery get to the fun part, which is the music and telling us about her new music and her new album. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Hello, hello. It's so wonderful to see um, so many familiar and friendly faces and some new ones as well. Um, welcome. And whenever I am getting ready for these events and feel myself getting that, I'm not going to say getting nervous, but, you know, like feeling that energy move through the body a little bit, I always have to remind myself, Avery, you, you chose this. No, <laughs> nobody asked you to be here. You asked them to come. So I always need a little bit of a breath. Would you take a breath with me here? <sighs> yeah, I feel like we all need a breath just to come into the space. Let's try one more. <sighs> Oh, yeah, that feels better. Um, I want to invite you to think about your favorite recorded song, a song that has really shaped your life, has become maybe part of the soundtrack of your life, you might say, um, one that you've listened to time and time and time again. And I would invite you to think about what it took to get that song into your ears, right? The folks who wrote it, uh, maybe on the back of a napkin or an envelope or in a notebook, uh, who worked through the music over and over and over and over again to make sure that it was just right before they brought it into the studio, who was there at the control board moving all the levers or way back in the day cutting the tape um, as you were sharing that song um, or as they were putting that song down to tape. Who were the people who listened to it and decided, yeah, I'm going to play that on my radio show. I'm going to sell that at my music store so that you, at some point, could get your hands on it, take it home to your record player, your CD player, your earbuds, however you listen to that music, into your ears for then you to feel it move you and become a part of your life in a way that that original writer scribbling on the envelope uh, could have had just no idea, you know, and may never know, really, what that song meant to you. But it must have meant something to them, and that's why they put it out there. Um, I think art is such a mysterious and awesome thing in that way. I really want to celebrate that tonight, just art in general and the power of it and the power of those who come to hear it. Um, I want to pull back the curtain a little, both on the recording process, the writing process, uh, just what it takes to put an album out in the world. Uh, but mostly, I just want to start that process of setting these songs free into the world and letting them arrive in your ears and maybe meaning something to you.
No matter the weather or how the earth shakes In the evening the whippoorwill sings his song Calling the souls of all who are gone I am no storm chaser I am no heart breaker I am only the one Who remembers And all that is here now is older than I Much will remain still after I die Oh, the rain, it will come and then pass away So simple, so gentle, as if it could say I am no storm chaser I am no heart breaker Of years of this dust and the winds of time I may think myself brave but I'm no pioneer no there just comes the time we each choose our frontier and I am no storm chaser I am no Thank you. All right. The One Who Remembers, that's the, the opening track, the title track, as we call it, um, of this new album. For those uh, who have known me for a while, the last full-length album I put out back in 2015 was called Dreams and Ghosts, a family album, and it was made up of Songs mostly about my ancestors, mostly about folks that I'd grown up hearing stories about and kind of the sense I'd made of their stories in my life, right? Um, but I had never actually met them. And this is sort of the next phase. These songs are all mostly about uh, experiences that I had and the stories of my own life that I have, again, brought forward and hel has have helped me make sense of, of my life and certainly uh, of the past nine years since that last album. A lot has happened since 2015, both for me personally, but also for us as a as a country, as communities all over, uh, all over the world. So it was due time to to share these with you all. And um, I was always it's funny I was here back in January of 2023, and so many of these songs that ended up on this album. I remember in January thinking, uh, I think these are the, this is the last time I'm going to play these songs. I think I'm kind of really done with them. But it became very clear after that show and as I was getting ready to, to go into the studio that, as my engineer ended up saying, they were not done with me. <laughs> and that happens sometimes. These, these songs become beings outside of yourself, and it's been a wonderful um, year to live in relationship with them in a new way, right? Because writing the song is very different from then going into the studio and recording it. So... Um, these are kind of the songs that I go back to for strength, for resolve. This next one in particular, uh, when I want to go back and remember, let me see one second, here we go. When I want to go back and remember that 
unapologetic, opinionated New Yorker that hides underneath this facade of being very nice and accommodating. <laughs> remember my great aunt Carolyn, born, raised, and died in Yonkers, New York. And we, <laughs> we had a saying about my aunt Carolyn that um, no good deed went unpunished. You never sort of put yourself out there without getting a little bit of a slap back. Not, not physically, but she was not like that. But just, you know, you just... Uh, yeah, you just had to be careful. You got what you asked for, maybe, is the better way to put it. But I spent enough time with her. Um, I grew up very close to where she lived that uh, I got to know her quite well, and it's because of her, really, that that whole first album I wrote was possible. Um, and it was always very clear, you know, behind everybody's personality, very often. You can still see the love that comes through. And she passed away um, on St. Patrick's Day of 2019, and at that time, my uh, son Oscar had just been born. He was about six months old. He was in the Snuggly, and we were out walking in the woods down around Oaks Bottom, and I was just sort of holding that moment of someone who's left the world and someone who's now newly in the world, and here I am, you know, sort of the tether between the two. She's the first person that I realized he is not going to know. Um, and so that's, I was holding all of that, walking through the woods here. It's called The Nest. the sun set in the west a brand new life upon my breast I said a prayer for you and all that I learned from you it's 
okay, take your rest. As for the nest, I'll do my best. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I know um, <clears throat> there are some other songwriters in the house tonight, I believe. Yes? Yes? You, you can, yes, you can be proud of that. Um, some folks, I was just teaching a songwriting workshop at the Manuka Ukulele Band Camp. Yes, there is a thing, and it is the best thing ever. Yes. And I was so proud of these songwriters. They really put themselves out on the line. Um, and it was so fun. It's always so fun to teach about this thing that you do, because it helps you think back on, like, what was I doing? <laughs> Holds you a little accountable to the things you're teaching, right? And I really, uh, I really enjoy that. And I thought I'd share about um, this song, this next one, is uh, a bit of a, a love song, if you will, to my to my mom and my stepfather who are here tonight. I don't know whether that's going to make me more apt to cry or less, so we'll find out. <laughs> I think we'll be fine. Um, but just from a time in our lives that you know could have been pretty wrought with conflict, but they just did such a good job making it a very stabilizing time, and that in turn has made it possible for me to be a stabilizing force for my own child. That just, you know, really, that stuff, there's a through line there that comes through. So that's the love story. But the songwriting story is kind of fun as well. Um, do we have any Kate Wolf fans in the house? I know Artichoke is a very Kate Wolf friendly. Yes, a couple, a couple folks. I love the work of Kate Wolf. And um, one of my favorite songs she wrote is a song called Green Eyes. And it's a love song. And when I first heard it, I was like, oh, this makes me think of my, my mom and stepfather, sort of what I imagine they feel about, uh, about each other. And also it helps that my mom has green eyes. So that worked, right? And I particularly loved the chorus. It went a little something like this. Green eyes that don't miss a thing They hold me like the sun going down Here's the great part. Hold me like a fire in the night Without a sound mm -hmm. Without a sound mm -hmm. And then it continues on. But that chorus was so just like lived in my ear. And um, the, it starts off with actually a very common chord progression. Everybody here in this room has heard this progression before. I call it the pop progression. This opening chord, root chord, music theory dorks will follow me to the five chord, to the minor six, and to the four. Very common in lots of different pop, uh, pop music from you know the Beatles up to whatever you heard on the radio on your way over here. So it's not that that was necessarily unusual, but it's that chord that came at the end that I was like, ooh, that's so juicy. And again, for my music theory dorks, that would be your two chord and make it a seven to make it extra, um, yeah, extra, like extra tension. Yes. Um, now, I didn't, uh, so anyway, so I really loved that. I was like, I'm stealing that. <laughs> And as we say in, in music, you don't really steal, but a lot of songs or a lot of art in general, any artist would tell you they enjoy the work of another artist, and so they take that as inspiration. They use it. I talk about using it as a template, right? You can change whatever you want about the template later. Sometimes we just sort of need that structure. So you will hear that progression in this song, and you will hear that juicy chord in there, and then it goes off, you know, somewhere somewhere else into Avery Hill song land, right? We've, we've now departed from, from Kate Wolf. So thank you to Kate Wolf for this song, uh, or at least the, the beginnings of it. This is called Harmonies in the Hallway. I think you'll be able to recognize my mother. That's all I'm going to say. Just 
You can mingle amongst yourselves. You can't, can't miss the resemblance. <laughs> Here we go. Harmonies in the hallway. I'm so sorry. They, they, they should have gotten used to this by now. This is what they get for coming to the show. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Another day ends down where the road bends, overlooking West Meadow Beach. We watched all the white caps, searched all the night maps for stars that seemed just out of reach. Still, we are reaching. Back up the path, a mile and a half to a house. That is barely a home There are holes in the floors Doorways without doors But we're learning to make it our own Still we are learning And at the end of the day I know I'm okay I The perfect coda. <laughs> the perfect coda, Arthur. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. All right. Um, yeah, okay. This next one. So this next song, I, by the way, I am playing these to you in order as they are on the album, um, just because I think they've got 
we've got that nice that nice flow. So just in case anybody was wondering, this next song. Okay, I have another songwriting story for you. This song. Anybody who's taken a, a songwriting workshop with me knows that I love sometimes to start with a list, because you know when you've got all this sort of pent up creative energy, you're like, I don't even. I would. I I need the perfect first line. No, you don't. You just need a list of things to start with. And this was back. Um, kind of right after I'd finished Dreams and Ghosts, and I wanted to make a list of things that I knew about my great-grandmother. Her name was Jenny Naomi Miller. That's number one. Um, and she ended up being known as Jenny Mogul, or to my mother and her siblings, she was Uma. And I made this list, and I thought, okay, all right, I've got some fun details. I'm going to try. What, what, what kind of a song is going to come out at this? I originally wrote it on the piano. I sat down at the piano, was sort of playing around with it. And... Towards the end of either you could call it the second verse or the end of the, end of the there's sort of a double double verse. Um, the lyric came to mind, or it sort of fit into the rhyme to say the the perspective changed, and the line comes: "There's something to be said, I think, for living your life in one place." And I thought, "Oh, maybe I'm in this song. <laughs> that wasn't the original intention." And so then that moves into the chorus. When I look into the mirror, sometimes I think I see a little bit of her in who I try to be. And I thought, ooh, this is going to be fun. This is going to be a nice conversation between her and myself. And then I got sort of to the last verse, and I was thinking, hmm, where am I going to leave myself here? Right? Another thing I talk about in my classes is what's the journey of the song? Where do we end? Where, where am I going to leave myself? Where am I going to leave the audience? At the end, and... Um, I started to think, okay, 100 years have gone now. Jenny, since Jenny left the farm, all her children and her children's children scattered near and far. Um, and maybe it was all those R's <laughs> that made me think of the word uh, daughter. And the, the line came, the daughter, and my, and my daughter comes for coffee every Sunday afternoon. We sit in the dining room, and I thought, oh, oh, actually, here comes my mom, <laughs> isn't it? Because the only reason I know anything about my great-grandmother is because of my mom. So it made perfect sense to invite her into the song, too. And so here we are, three, three women in the song um, that ended up being titled after a, a, a physical item, a spoon jar, that jar that sits on the table just for spoons. You either had it or you didn't, and that's just fine. That was just sat on Oma's table, sat on our table, uh, something I really remember growing up, that sort of connecting object between these three women that appear in this song. It's called The Spoon Jar. Jenny was a farm girl like her what work needed be done, that's the work she'd do. When her stomach swelled one summer, it was a brand new start and a whole different work to do. Just a simple woman, just a simple life, you'd say, with a house to clean and kids to feed. Most every day But there's something to be said, I think For living your life in one place And when I look into the mirror Sometimes I think I see A little bit of her She served everything on China, weather 
whether she knew you or not what she made she gave freely and when i look into the mirror sometimes i think i see a little bit of her in who i try to be no one special no one grand just a steady eye and a steady hand to give something to this world that this world can understand a hundred years have gone now since Jenny left the farm all her children and their children's children were scattered near and far and my daughter comes for coffee every sunday afternoon we sit in the dining room with a jar just for spoons to remember who we are and when she looks into the mirror i wonder if she'll see a little bit of all of us and who she wants to be someone special someone grand with a steady eye and a steady hand to give something to this world that this world can understand After carrying a ukulele around for the week, that guitar is awfully heavy. <laughs> um, this uh, this past week, I had jury duty, um, and I ended up being called up to to a jury, and so it brought me to the 14th floor of the Multnomah County Courthouse, um, which is kind of brand new. I think it opened in 2020, and they've apparently went through great uh, pains to make it a friendly looking place <laughs> um, and especially a little bit more accommodating to folks going in for, for jury duty. So during the orientation, they said during your breaks, we encourage you to go around and uh, look at the art. You know, we've put up a lot of art displays. It's really beautiful. Go look at the view of the river, all those things. And so that was how I ended up um, on the 14th floor, was called up there. And during one of the breaks, I found a display of um, Chinook combs that had been carved by a Chinook artist named Greg Robinson. Um, if you're ever at the courthouse, 14th floor, it's right there off the elevator. And I was so, I mean, I was struck. There were so many things I could say about it. I started to write a blog post and it went like in so many directions. I thought, okay, I need to focus here. But what I want to say tonight is that it um, was striking to me that he chose a comb to create this beautiful piece of art. What he was doing with these combs is you had the, the the teeth combs kind of going down, carved out of cedar wood. Um, and on the top, the wood had remained intact and he had carved different characters from Chinook mythology into them. And they were just breathtaking. Um, to, and to be able to get up so close and to see the detail that went into it, the care and the intention. And I thought, but it's a comb. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's a piece of art. It was not ever meant to comb anybody's hair, but it really reminded me of how these everyday things can have so much meaning to you and, and should and did and could all of those, all of those things. And it, it reminded me of the art just sort of as an opportunity to take those stories that we love and the stories we've experienced and the meaning we've made from them and to put it into solid form. That was one of the thoughts I had about that, and I'm gonna just stop it right there, because otherwise you're not, I, I'm not gonna be able to stop. And it made me think about this tiny, teeny tiny piece of folk art from a, from a five-year-old, six-year-old artist. Hold on one second. It's this. God forsaken excuse of a potholder. Um, I'm gonna carbon date this around 1990, 1991, <laughs> especially it's so, 
It's so misshapen. It's clearly a Christmas gift because it's green and red. I gave this to my Aunt Rinda, um, wove it with my five, six-year-old hands and, and gave it to her, and she used it. And I'm so, <laughs> so happy. And my Uncle David recently gave it back to me, um, which is just so special. I'm so glad to, to have it back. But it, again, reminded me of those ways that we take these stories of our lives and we give them form, that even in those everyday ways in which we do that, we are all artists, and that is the act of making art in whatever capacity we choose to do it. This was a story I was seeking to put into, into form, giving back that, that love that I felt given to me. I'm going to play this one on the ukulele because it just felt appropriately cheery and childlike. Coming through all right? Okay. Merry Christmas, happy birthday. I made this just for you. A pot holder of cotton loops on my red square metal loom. You can use it when you're cooking or as a coaster for your coffee so that even when we're far apart I know you're thinking of me Pull into your driveway Another summertime begins We will swim and talk and eat and walk Along the water's edge Each day will rise just like the sun And set into memory Like those good books we go back and read Time and again time turns summer into winter And holidays to share Your smile at the table To know that everyone is there there's a warmth that surrounds us all long after we leave So that even when we're far apart I know you're thinking of me And these days now that you're gone Potholders still by the stove, by your favorite reading chair. I can't believe you kept them. After all, I was just a kid. But I smile to think just one thing that you loved was something that I. By the lake and the garden beneath the old oak tree. And even though we're far apart, now you are a part of me. One day this potholder will fall apart, but never will. take a, a moment. Actually, I'm going to grab the guitar here. I'm so glad it's raining for this next song. This is such a water song. <laughs> folks on the live stream. I don't think I've actually said hello to folks out in the in the world of the of the internet. Thank you all for for being here. Um, it is pouring rain in Portland because that's what it does in April here. Either it's sunshine and 70 or it's pouring rain as it makes up its mind. That's very appropriate for this next one. Um, one thing I wanted to take the opportunity to do here, especially before this song, as I got to the, we were all done tracking, as they say in the studio. We had all the pieces and then we put together the mix that was kind of 
if you put your earphones on, how what is the sonic experience of, of listening to the song like? And there are lots of details that go into that. And uh, as I was listening to all the mixes, even after I decided I was like, check, 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 this all sounds great, okay, phew, this is the song I would go back to because I will never play this song without hearing the amazing accordion of Jenny Conley in my ears. I cannot wait for you to hear what she's added on to, uh, to this song and what all the studio <coughs> musicians added on. So I wanted to just take a, a brief moment to mention. So Jenny Conley wrote, uh, or wrote, Jenny Conley played accordion, uh, <coughs> piano. She even plays some organ. Yes, there is a place for organ and folk music um, on, uh, on these tracks. And she does them, just, just does it so brilliantly. She was a, a pleasure to work with. Um, Catherine Clare, if anybody, I, I know she's played here several times before. She's a fiddle player. Does a brilliant job on, on two of the songs, including uh, Potholder. She's on that one. Um, and uh, Aaron Elliott and Dale Jones also played a bit of bass on a couple couple different songs. And um, Aaron and his uh, uh, trio, Flyover States, along with Jess and uh, Stephen Patton and Aaron Elliott, they make up Flyover States. They just had a show here recently. I don't know if anybody made it was ex they're they're just great they're wonderful folks and wonderful musicians which is always you always feel so lucky they lent their uh, harmonies to harmonies in the hallway so when you get that in your ears just just prepare to be gobsmacked with their just beautiful beautiful presence there along with one other one other tune so um, I, I say that and I want to name them out loud even though they're not here because I want to remind you that um, at a fundraising event right there's a lot of uh, I, when you when you donate or when you pre-order an album like this from an independent musician, it's not just the personal work of the of the musician that you're supporting. You're really supporting the work of an entire artistic community, right? All of these musicians have become to be a part of it. The studio engineer Steve Drizos was there um, to make everything sound great. I'm gonna give a shout out to Vicky Green, who's back here, who was the vocals producer. If you like the vocals, you can thank her because there's no one who's gonna pull the best vocal out of me like Vicky can. We were talking about that before the show. Um, just wonderful, wonderful people were really a, a part of this. And so by supporting the album, you are supporting a whole community of people. And I thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So this song is so funny. I wrote this from the perspective of a house. I was thinking, like, what would a house, what kind of a story would the house tell about a family that lives in it? Um, but somehow I keep, through the writing of it, it's... I'm like floating on the ocean. And so maybe our house was like this houseboat uh, somehow, some, something in between. Who knows how these things happen? You start one place and you end up another. This is Walk Through the Door. I learned 
other what we're moving through is time I can feel the day is coming you'll be going This job that I've had You'll know it's time By the ebb of the tides To take you where the winds will You are stronger than you know And where you go I'll be with you still Walk through the door Go find what you're looking for When you're ready to go Thank you. Oh, back to the ukulele for this one. Do I have some ukulele pants on here? <laughs> I felt, uh, when I first put this out to my newsletter, I have a lot of ukulele students and folks that I know through that world, and I felt like I needed a disclaimer on this album. There are actually no ukuleles on it. Um, I know, can you imagine? <laughs> this song I wrote um, on the, the piano. Um, I wanna give a shout out now, this is my reminder, to uh, give huge, huge thanks to Danny Joy and Perry Stauffer, who were going to be the hosts for the original fundraising show, Had I Not Gotten the Flu. That was not fun, I will tell you. And so I was going to do this show in their teeny tiny, very cozy, wonderful apartment. And um, I was like, I'm not bringing a piano in here. I'd have to kick out half the audience. Um, so I worked it up on the ukulele. And I thought, well, I could, we could have dragged this thing up there, but I just, I actually kind of like it now on the uke. I think it, think it works. This is one of those tunes um, that breaks one of my rules about songwriting, and I always tell my students, anytime there's a rule in music, just know that it will and has already been broken many times. Um, so we use that word rule, you know, uh, a little loosely there. But um, this is a song I always feel like does need a little bit of introduction, a little bit of context. I like to believe that most of my songs don't. But this is a song I wrote uh, for my grandfather. He taught me a, a poem when I was very young. Well, first he tried to teach me a, a prayer, the very common children's prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And um, I do not remember this. As it has been told to me, again, when I was about four, five, or six, and I can, having a five-year-old now, I completely see how this happened. I sort of protested a little bit. The new generation protests the, the paradigms of the older generation when I said, but Papa, I don't want to die. <laughs> and that really took him by surprise, apparently, and he had to sort of, he came, came back later and uh, taught me this poem. It's one, one stanza from a poem by George Linnaeus Banks that he had found somewhere along the way, made a bit of a credo for himself. And I, I think of it as a, as a prayer as well. And it goes like this. I live for those who love me, for those who know me true, for the heaven that shines above me and awaits my spirit too, for the cause that needs assistance, for the wrong that lacks resistance, for the future in the distance, and the good that I can do. Isn't that so nice? And I, uh, so I, part of it is sort of a confession. I did not 
write all the lyrics to this song. <laughs> Part of them are from, from that poem, which you'll hear later on. And, you know, um, my grandfather was a, a general in the Air Force. We grew up with a lot of reverence um, for the military and understanding it as one of many ways in which we could be of service to our community. And that no matter what job we chose when we got older, that was really the goal, is to find your way to, to serve the folks around you, whatever that path was. Um, for those of my generation, we, we came of age, went off to college in September of 2001, um, and in the years that followed, it was just a really tumultuous time, and it really was hard to watch what was happening in the world and square that with what I had grown up with. Um, and so this was a song that I wrote because I never got a chance to talk to him. I never had a very frank conversation with him about the work that he did, but I did have these little bits and pieces of prayers and poems and credos uh, words of wisdom that he'd he'd passed on, and um, so this is sort of my take on what this conversation might have sounded like. It's called "The Good That I Can Do." If I asked you if you loved me say of course I do if I asked why I never heard you say it you'd say you didn't have to you'd say if you are blessed enough to know what true love is you don't say it with words you say it with how you And if I asked you why you chose to work the work you chose to do, you'd say it was for God and country what you were sent to do. You'd say we all have to live our lives so at the end of every day we can say we did our best, at least in our own way.
Are you ready for the pitch? Because I got one. No, I am. Um, yeah, I have a little bit I want to share, and then I got one more song, and then there's going to be a little Q and A section. So if you have any questions about the songwriting process, any of the songs that you heard, um, anything about the crowdfunding or the, the recording process, please. There are index cards. I can get you some pens. We'll have a little. Well, that's it's coming a little bit later, including folks out. Um, in the internet world, we'll find a way to get your questions too. Um, no, what I want to say first is, as, as you could intimate from that from that song, you know, my work is quite different from um, the the work of the folks that raised me. But that through line really is that sense of service, and I think that it's kind of an ideal that. I'm going to say for all the people in this room, I can't speak for all the people in the world, but based on who I know in this room, that ideal is true for them, that you want to find work that is fulfilling for yourself, but also somehow serves a greater, a greater good and um, helps us to find the good that, that, we all, uh, that we all can do. So I want to, I'm going to go out on a limb, but you all are such kind people. I feel like I can take this risk. I want to invite you into a thought experiment with me. Okay, I want you to think about the work that you do in your job, or that you did if you're retired, work that you did, or maybe the work that you do now in retirement. There, I mean, I don't. Work comes in many, many different forms, but I want you to imagine this is your your livelihood, and instead of being employed by uh, an employer who you know interviews you and says, "Oh yeah, you're a great." fit for the job, this is what we want you to do, and this is what your salary is going to be. You've been asked to do a job, but you're not going to get paid for it yet. And you believe so much in this, in this work that you are, you are going to do it, right? You're, you're, this is the work that you want to do, so this is how, uh, how it's going to go. You're going to do this. Now, because you're not going to be paid by anybody for the time that you put into the work that you do, you're going to have to come up with some kind of a tangible product to sell to people that somehow sums up some part of what you do so that you can get paid. Like this is how you're going to get paid is through this product that you create based on all this work that you're doing um, with the rest with the rest of your time, right? And once you figure out what this product is, uh, then you have to pay for it to be first, you know, produced and manufactured and get it out get it out on the shelf. But remember, you still haven't been paid yet for the work you've already done to figure out what that product is and to, and to actually make it. Okay, so then you have to set a price for that product and you have to uh, promote it. You essentially have to convince people to pay you for work that you've already done. Um, they haven't actually watched you do it and they don't really know what it's going to mean to them because it, you know, it's like this, this thing. But you have to convince them that this is something they really want. And this takes time. It's like a whole other job to figure out not just what your work is, but then how you're going to convince people to pay you for it, right? And also money for a publicist or advertising, a website, all of those things. Okay, so then if you're lucky, little by little, all works out. You've got this product out there. You're paid for that product. But keep in mind, you've already paid for its production. So really, you're just recouping the costs of like what you made originally you're still not paid for all this work that you've done over here to get, you know, to get ready for it, right? Okay, so then you're thinking, well, this is what business models are for, Avery, right? Don't you get some investors or you go to the bank and you get a loan, you know? But the problem is the work that you do isn't really going to give them any financial returns, right? This is not an investment that they're going to make money off of. Because remember, this is service to your community. This is meaning, making meaning in the world, right? Oh, no, I'm deviating over to my, yeah, anyway. So this is not exactly work that they are going to invest in. So you're still kind of, you're still kind of by yourself. Okay. As I said, because this is service to our community. Ultimately, we all need each other in some way to survive, right? Even if I don't need the service that you individually offer, um, this is that we, we all need somebody. And to try, we don't really have a way to commodify that. We don't really have a way to set a value on that. But we live in an economy that uses that as its main template. So here you are doing this work that you love and you're trying to fit this intangible work into this template of a tangible thing. You are now an independent artist. <laughs> 
Congratulations, right? Now, I am not, I, I am not calling to tear down the capitalist system. I will save that for another day with another community, perhaps. But today, the, 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 the whole point I'm, I am trying to make is that as creative artists, we have to work within this template and be creative. And that is why we crowdfund, right? This is why we ask folks to pre-order, why we ask to donate, because this is how you have the power to enable artists, not just myself, again, an entire artistic community, to take this very intangible work, put it into tangible form, but ultimately continue building our human connections to each other, right? Now, Again, in asking you to uh, financially contribute to this album, which all of you have by buying tickets today, by the way, so you already have. Um, by doing that, it uh, y you are not going to get a financial return on this project, right? I made that clear. I'm not asking you to be investors <laughs> in, in the traditional sense, because even though I am a creative artist and I will work inside of that template, I think we all have the capacity to think outside of that template too. And so, so much of my work is outside of that template because I know that you, as the audience, you are as much a part of your artistic community as I am as the artist, right? You are the listeners. I've made this meaning, I have given it to you. You're gonna make new meaning out of it. You were just as much a part of it as I am. Um, do you remember that opening question about your favorite recorded song and the meaning that you have given it, that it's had in your life? That's you. Like, you're a part of that, too. So all of this work that we as independent artists make, yes, we start with our own experience. It comes through us, from us, but ultimately we do it. We do it for you. These songs are already yours, <laughs> right? And by... Um, um, these songs are already yours. We are here for you as artists. And I just want to thank you for being here for us as well. That's my, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Our volunteers are here to take your calls at 1-800, no. <laughs> Whew, I worked hard on that. I really, I want this, these crowdfunding efforts to, um, I don't know, maybe it's the teacher in me to just have a little bit of education in there. I just can't help it. I just can't help it. All right. As I said, I've got one more song. We're going to take a break then, um, and a very quick break. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them on the index cards there, and I'll come back up and answer those. Any questions you might have about, again, the recording process, the songwriting process, any of that. If you bought a ticket for today from Artichoke, not uh, not as a donation to um, uh, on my website separately, make sure you write your name and your contact information on that index card as well, because by buying a ticket for today, you get an album uh, once it's here. So make sure I have a good way to, to contact you. All right, make sure that's that information is on there. Um, the other thing I'll talk about when I get back is there are different uh, levels of rewards I've been thinking about, so I'll share some kind of fun information if folks want to pool their funds together and get some fun, fun treats to enjoy on the other end. I'll talk about all that afterwards. Uh, nope, no more minor chord songs, Avery. We're going to end it on a nice, uh, nice positive note here. This, this last song is such a fun one to, to end on, thinking about riding this adventure together. Um, this is a song I wrote over 10 years ago. It's one of the oldest on the albums, and it just kept not fitting. It kept not quite ringing true for me until I brought it into the fold with these songs and reworked the lyrics a little bit and realized it's, it's the perfect pivot song of this whole album where you, oh, you gather up those things from the past that serve you. You let go of the things that don't serve you anymore and you, uh, you take your steps into the future. And it sounds very dramatic, but we do it every day. <laughs> and um, this is a song that celebrates that, that pivot into the future. It's called Roll Down the River. River flow down below, below my window. Do you know where you go and how to follow? Open the door. 
river bend if you can can you What's your plan? We're in your hands. We're in this together. Lean left, lean right. Read the river, read the sky. It's okay to feel unsure, and it's okay to be brave, cause darling you're the one I'm rolling for, you're the tomorrow to see me through today. River flow down below Here we go Thank you so much Thank you. So take about five or ten minutes, take a breather, go uh, get another uh, drink from the bar if you like, or a snack. I'll be back here with your, with your questions here, if there are any questions to be had. And if not, um, I'll just share a little bit more about some of the, the rewards that I'm offering as part of the crowdfunding efforts. And folks at home tuning in, stick around. We'll, we'll still be here, too. All right. See you in ten.
one of the goals that I have for these crowdfunding efforts is just to pull back the curtain a little bit. Like I said, some folks don't know what it what it takes, or also just like what's involved in the process of recording an album, writing a song, um, all those things, putting it out to to the world. And so, I'm a teacher, so <laughs> I'll talk forever. <laughs> but I promise I won't do that tonight. <laughs> I am under strict instructions by my five year old to pick him up no later than uh, seven o'clock. So I'll be kicking you out of here pretty soon. No. Um, okay. Couple things to to share before I get to the questions. First of all, I you have uh, on your tables, and there are more um, in the back, and those out in the internet. Let me know if you want some of these. Um, this is part of the thinking outside the template part that I was talking about earlier. Um, putting some trust in the good old U.S. Postal Service. I have postcards here, and on the back it says, "Hello, fill in the blank of the person." This is Avery Hill, and I think you will enjoy the songs on her new album because, and this is where you get to be creative, you can learn more at blah, 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 from, and then you can sign your name. Yours out there should have a stamp on it already, so I encourage you to spread the word. Somebody had already said, oh, I know exactly who I'm going to send this to. That is great. Word of mouth is the way that we like to do it. Again, believing in that human connection and, and strengthening those, those bonds. That's what we're going for. So feel free to take that with you um, or fill it out here, and I'm happy to pop it in the mail for you. Um, yeah, so that's that. The other thing I wanted to let you know, um, one thing that artists often do through a platform like Kickstarter is they have different levels of rewards. So if you give X amount, it's kind of like the answer to the investor thing, right? You're not going to get a financial return, but the more you give, the bigger kind of gift you'll get. And that will be some kind of piece of merch. People make tote bags. The last time I did this, I had t-shirts made, which is all um, fine and good. I shied away from all of that this time. Again, I really wanted to keep it like you and me, just in this great, beautiful room together that is either here at Artichoke or just the big, big old world. Um, but I did, uh, there are a couple things that I'd love to just in invite you to consider, right? First of all is, and as you spread the word too, you can let folks know. Um, on my website and uh, Gary in the back Thank you, Gary, has been so wonderful about running the live stream and running the sound tonight. Um, uh, has a QR code for folks there at home. You can also find it uh, on my website as well. If you go to that page where you can donate, there's all the different lists. There's the, you know, pre-order your digital download, pre-order your CD, pre-order your vinyl. A couple folks, I put that out as a little, yeah, as a little teaser, and that some folks have really uh, latched onto that. So I'm excited to pr press them some vinyl for that. And then there are some additional uh, on top of that, $50, $75, $100. And that's just your way of saying, great, I'm so excited for the album. And here's just a little bit extra to help you recoup those costs sooner, right? So you can get to that whole part about all the stuff that happened before we got into the studio um, and to continue on and uh, to work work on the next project or just get out and be able to travel more and share that um, share that album. So the at the kind of top end of it, I thought this through and um, I was trying to think about rewards that represented work that I really want to do. And I love a tote bag as much as anybody else does, but I really don't want to think about what image is going to be on a tote bag. So I just decided not to do those this time around. But instead, um, one of the things that I'm offering is a, a free house concert or a workshop for you and your family or your, your group of music uh, learners, musical friends. And so for $500, I will come and do that here in the Portland region. You're welcome to do that as an individual. You're also welcome to pool your money together with your friends to do that too. And I'll come and do this show for you in your living room or this workshop, right? It could be, we've got some ukulele folks, could be more songwriting, it could be anything related to music or the creative process. Um, at the $750 level that I can go outside of Portland, right, anywhere in Washington and Oregon, and then for 1000 I'll go anywhere in the United States. And I know I have, and maybe some friends are tuning in from Canada. 
give me a call. We'll, we'll figure something out. We'll figure something out. I've been looking for an excuse and a reason to get up to Canada for a long time. So um, just all to say, just the, fur the further out, it just incurs more travel costs for me, and that's why there are those, those different levels. But again, you don't have to do it on your own. You can pull your funds together with your family, your friends, um, if that feels like something that you're excited to do. That is then a, a gift I am more than happy to give because that's exactly the kind of work I love love to do. So all of that is uh, is on my website, averyhill.studio. If you go to the shop, you'll look for the little, uh, I believe it's this little image here, the Let's Grow Some Art uh, fundraiser image. Click on there and all the options are there. Okay, that's, I'm really glad that part's over. Let's get to the fun stuff. I have some questions from the audience. I'm such a teacher, it's so bad. Okay. Um, oh, this is a great question. What was the alternate tuning you used with the small capo and then with the double capo? A whole new world. Um, I love sharing that. I, I actually, I mean, when I first started doing it, I was like, I'm going to do this because it looks cool. Um, and I, I mean, that's not really, but it, 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 what happens is it makes for different um, sounds. So when you strum the guitar... Like that. That's op that's um, that's what it sounds like, and you have to then put your fingers on different places to make the chords, right? But what's kind of fun is that when you use this, well, I'll just say, the regular capo is used to take those same chords, and now I can play the same shape, but it's higher, right? So I it basically is a little bit of a cop out. It means I can play my favorite shapes, but I don't, you know, I get to sing a little bit higher as if, if I like. However, take that off, that doesn't really change much. This really changes things because the partial capo, it's so small that it only covers certain strings. So in the songs I played today, I put it right here on the uh, D, oh man, I'm translating between guitar and ukulele. Um, D, G, and B strings here. So this, the one closest to the floor is still open and the two closest to me are still open, but these are on the second fret, so I now have an open chord, which just sounds so lovely. I could, I mean, that's technically an A chord. That's how I would usually put my fingers there, but then I can add in some other things. Uh, and it has that nice drone at the top. So it really, I choose to use these, this kind of partial capo when I want what's called a different voicing. I just want the chord to still be the chord that it is, but just to sound a little different, and especially to have a nice, warm, open string chord. It's just like, oh, feels great, doesn't it? Ooh, I just want to take a bath in that chord. Okay. And then, so again, the the long capo here then just takes that and moves it up and down same way that it would uh, for a regular tuning. The, the double capo was just taking that um, open tuning and moving it up a key. Yeah. Okay, great question. One, I, um, I took a one, oh, does anybody um, remember Chris Kokesh? Any fans here? Yes. Okay. I, I knew there was going to be at least one person. She's, she's been in Minnesota a number of years now. But I took a uh, um, partial capo workshop from her. Clearly, I need to maybe offer one here. That would be really fun. Okay. So here's the next question. Explain the cost or volume decision for making CDs. Um, this is from Stan. Stan, do you mean like how do you decide what to charge for a CD? Yeah. And how many to make. And how many to make. Okay. Well, that's why pre-orders are important, folks. So I know how many people want. Um, I'll likely also work with a publicist who will tell me to set aside X number to send off to um, mostly radio DJs and a couple other, you know, a couple other folks that will want to know about it. Um, so you know, typically, I think the last time I started with a thousand and went through those actually pretty quickly because again, a bunch of them go out to publicity and then there's also the just the overall overall um, promotion and then it's just a matter of where you are when you get to the end of those and um, if you've moved on to the next project or whatever. So you can make them in, in smaller batches. That's for me. I mean, Brandy Carlisle is gonna have like a million made, but you know, but I'm, I'm, a thousand is great, great to start for me. Um, and the cost and the, like, the cost is sort of interesting because 
that is more like to come back to the capitalist model. You have to just sort of see what the going rate is as far as what CDs are. One group I saw did a really brave thing and said, we're just doing a pay what you can for the CDs. They didn't really name the price. Maybe I will try that at some point. That's always a little bit um, a little bit tough. But a, a full-length album right now is typically $15. If you are more... Um, uh, I want to be. I was going to say, like, if you're in the higher echelons, not to value anybody, but if you are better known, sometimes you can ask for twenty. But that's, you know, you just have to sort of see what what feels good for you. I always like to run it by the other folks I'm sharing a show with because I don't want there to be any sort of competition there either. Okay, and where are you in fundraising versus the goal? Ooh, that's a great question. There was a long sort of on ramp to this, which is sort of the official launch of it all, but we have about $2,500 already, and that doesn't even count the wonderful folks here tonight who bought their tickets or who are donating on online tonight. So we're off to a good start, um, but I am hoping to raise about $10,000 is what is, is again, a, something that it, it always costs more than that, but that's what we that's what we raise for. That's the goal. really makes a huge, huge dent um, in all of that. So we're off to a good start, but of course we still have quite quite a ways to go. So spreading the spreading the word is very much appreciated. Um, oh, this is also a great question um, that's sort of combined with one that came from the back too. Do song lyrics ever seem to jump out at you from nowhere, like the subconscious or dreams? And connected to a, a question I got from the back of like songs that come really quickly versus songs that you're just hitting your head up against the wall for. Um, and I will say. The quickest song that ever came to me um, was this one. I'll just sing a little bit of it. Oh, I've lived on this hill for many a year, many a year have I. Each day I walk down the hill into town just to say hello and goodbye. I walk by the baker. I walk by the school I go read the paper Just to see what's in the news When it gets dark I walk back up the hill Back up the hill do I For I have done what I wanted to do I have said hello and goodbye goes on to describe this being that is um, making their way through this town. And at, uh, at the time, I was traveling in Germany in a city where I had lived um, fresh out of college, and I was so excited to be back. This was in my later 20s. And um, thought, oh, I'm just going to go and relive all these wonderful memories that I had living here until I got there. And I realized all of my friends, and I had known this, but it didn't really hit me, all of my friends had moved out of this town. So I was sort of wandering around a little like, why do I feel like a ghost in my own hometown here? And there was something about that moment that I went home to the apartment where I was staying and I happened to be holding the pen and out came the story from the beyond right like it really did come so that's the fastest song I've ever written right sometimes they really do come and I think a lot of the time in that case at least for me uh you definitely feel like I am not alone in writing this song and that's just a really fun like good kind of spooky spooky feeling um, but I would say the hardest song to write, well, I'm actually in the middle of the hardest song. I haven't actually finished it yet, has been the hardest song. I'll, maybe by next year I'll, I'll have it done. But I think the hardest ones are the ones that, um, I have a couple that I wrote, and I didn't realize until, Roll Down the River is one of those. I had to live my way into understanding what that song was really about. It's sort of like the song came, but I wasn't, quite in that point in my life where I could understand it and it was just sort of there waiting for me at the end to get down the river you know to where this where this song was those are the hardest ones because you just have to keep living your life and say I'm gonna know what this is about one day I don't know it now you have to sort of trust into in in that that part of the the creative process did anybody else have any questions about about this whole thing yeah 
How, how long have I been writing songs is the question. I did, well, I started to play guitar when I was, mom, 14, 15. What happened was <laughs> I sort of became obsessed with the 60s, and I thought when I grew up, I wanted to be a hippie from the 60s, except that that's not really how time works. Like, you can't go back to the 60s. So one of the things that I knew about hippies in the 60s is they played the guitar. And so I started to play the guitar, and I had my John Denver play-along you know, book. Oh, man. And, um, and then I was like, oh, I can do this. Now, any songwriter will admit that we don't ever admit to writing the very first songs that we wrote, because I'm sure they were all about my high school boyfriend and they were you know, like not very good. But I've, so I've been, to answer your question, been at it um, since I was 15. So certainly for more than half, half my life. Um, but professionally, I've been at it about 10, 10 years. I think that Dreams and Ghosts, the album that I put out, that was the first full length. Um, yeah, and been been doing that for for a while now. Any other questions? Is yeah, Mike. There, is there anything you could share with our friends on Facebook to say anything about the album? Sure. Or, I mean, something that we could post that you created maybe. Oh. Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, linking to the pa linking to my website is probably the best and easiest way to do it. Um, if you can just yeah, if you want to share that link and say went to the show, this sounds great, I encourage you to check it out. Send your postcards, that's a great way to do it too, but certainly on social media. And I will be, I should say, um, for those who follow me or if you want to follow me on, this, on social media, I'll be posting a lot about the album itself, posting more about the folks who played on it, um, more about that creative process and all of that. So anytime you see that coming up on your feed, feel free to share it, and that would be great. Help spread the word. Such a good question. Yes, you're getting into the to the whole publicity release season here. Um, I will probably release two songs as singles before the official album comes out. And believe you me, you will know when that happens. <laughs> I'll be I'll be in your inboxes and and on your on your uh, social media feeds uh, for that. So th and that would be wonderful if you could pass that on. Yeah, thank you. When will the physical CD be released? That is such a good question. Um, I was really hopeful it was going to get uh, done this spring, but because of my son and I have been kind of sick back and forth for so, so, like several months over the course of the winter, my best guess is that it's actually going to be more like this fall. Summer is a little bit hard, <laughs> and so knowing that I'm not going to get it out before the summer, I'm going to aim for the fall, late September, early October. Um, once again, you will know <laughs> when, it, when, it, when it comes out. Yeah, Ben. That's right. You were at that show I talked yeah. about. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's yeah, right. It was awesome. We heard all those wonderful songs. And um, I guess my first question is, is, like, how many songs have you written over your whole life? And then you had your first album. How many songs were on this one? And then remind me how many are on this one. So how did oh, you, yeah. you, like, pick all those songs that you did and say, I'm going to put them on this, song, this album and then on this album and probably left yeah. them out that you were thinking of keeping? Like, what is the ideal quantity on an album? When, so remember when I told you about all that work that you do that you don't ever get paid for until the very end? That's part of it, right? You have to sort of make the make the decisions. Um, so, dream, okay, I'll, let me address that in a couple ways. First of all, I have no idea how many songs I've written. I mean, are we talking about songs that I would admit to have written? <laughs> songs that I still play? So much of the songwriting process, one thing I always try to in encourage my students as a way of encouraging myself is that you don't have to press every song you write to paper. The great, you know, painting masters or, or you know, sketch, they sketched a lot before they actually painted. And there's a lot of that to songwriting too. There are plenty of songs I've written that I say, I have learned a lot from the writing of that song, and nobody is ever going to hear it again. <laughs> and that is okay, you know. Um, that's just fine. So it's hard to say how many, how many. But the first album I put out had 12 songs. I would say that is between 8 and 12 is, uh, I mean, well, 8 and 12, 8 to 12 would be considered, I think, a full-length album more and more because folks like to put things out more regularly. They will do a shorter album, something that's called an EP. Um, goes back to the days of when an initial, Vicky, you're going to have to help me with this. Is that the eponymous album? Like the intro album was like five to six songs traditionally. I, I always thought it was like 10 to 15. 
Oh, extended play. Oh, okay. Uh, then I have my history wrong. Um, but uh, folks are going to shorter albums uh, so that they can release them more often. So it's a little bit it's a little bit in in flux at the moment. This uh, album, the one who remembers, has these eight songs, um, but it also has some fun um, additional things. I forgot to mention that uh, there are these four, I'm calling them echoes, they're sort of interstitial tracks, so in between the songs you're gonna hear some sounds that create a little bit, it's like an audio postcard from somewhere in the past. I was able to create those with some found sounds, um, uh, meaning that I recorded out in the world. Um, I was also, thanks to uh, my brother who works in music licensing, was able to find some of those sounds that other folks had recorded that uh, much better than I could have ever. So it's kind of a combination of those. So there are 12 tracks, but not all of them are the, uh, the songs. There are some kind of scenes that you hear um, in between. Good questions. Anybody else? I'm loving these. Was there a question in the back, Steve, or no? Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I, th I thought I saw a hand go up. Okay. Well, if you have, oh, one more question here. Yes, John. I think we have a new recruit for songwriting classes, folks. <laughs> Um, the question was, as an engineer who doesn't know anything about the creative process, which I com completely disagree with, but I'm just going to put that, we, I know you, I'll, I'll convince you of that otherwise later on. Um, how do you open your heart? How do you put yourself out there? Um, actually, I'd kind of want to ask the folks who were at the songwriting class this last week that I, that I taught because it's, it is, it's, it's messy. You do have to get comfortable, I think, with being uncomfortable. I think that's true of art in general. I think um, you have to be okay with, or you have to be willing to kind of put it out there and then also get a little bit of distance from it to see, oh yeah, this, oops, this sort of makes sense together. This doesn't, I don't really need to put this in here even though I really love it. I'm gonna let that be. Um, I don't know. What would you all, there are songwriters on the audience. What would you say? Yeah, so, Tracy. So I took a short workshop with somebody else teaching songwriting, and he said, don't, don't wait for it to be perfect. You, you're going to wait 800 years to spit it out, to spit it out. <laughs> so true, <laughs> so cool. true. And I think, too, like not investing so much in the beginning of the process, you know, like just play, just have fun with words, have fun with music. Imitate what other people are doing. Learn how to play other people's songs and learn how to play them really well. I mean, all of the ideas I got for my songs were back to my John Denver songbook, you know. I was just sort of channeling that and then finding my voice. Another really, um, you know, important songwriter for me at that time was Dar Williams. And I, I can hear, it's funny, there are these old recordings of myself playing my guitar and I'm like, I was listening to a lot of Dar Williams. You know, I'm just imitating her style. And that's, you do that so in that you start to find your own voice. And so it's really just, you don't have to worry about writing a song, it's mostly just, oh, I'm gonna play around with some music, I'm gonna play around with some words, I'm gonna imitate this person. I'm, it's a little fake until you make it in some ways. You just sort of try it on and then you're like, oh right, this works, or this is, you know, this is what you learned from other songwriters and from the process of, of doing it yourself. So it's kind of one, one, one day at a time. But that first leap of like putting yourself out there, that's why I always say, start with a list. A list is really easy, you know, and then over time you start to dig, dig a little deeper and get a little bit more comfortable putting it out. Great. Well, as I said, I have a deadline. I have a very important <laughs> boss who's waiting for me. I want to take this opportunity to thank one more time and invite you all to give a round of applause to all the folks here at Artichoke. Gary on sound here <laughs> and the live stream. Thank you, Gary. Wendy here at the bar who has taken such good care of you. And Steve who checked you in. Wonderful, wonderful team. Um, and Shelly also who uh, introduced me at the, at the beginning. She worked so hard to keep, keep the doors open here. So thank you for being here. Your ticket purchases do support Artichoke. So thank you for that. And, um, and uh, come back to another show soon. Doesn't have to be mine. Just come back here. It's a beautiful place. You can't, you can't miss out. Thanks, everybody. Safe, safe travels and keep in touch. Thank you.